Our Across the Aisle segment tonight, the Congressional Budget Office released their estimate on the American Health Care Act yesterday, giving good news on budget savings, but perhaps bad news politically. The AHCA saves the federal government $337 billion in deficit spending over the next decade. However, the CBO estimates that 14 million Americans would become uninsured. With me now, former Democratic Georgia State Representative LaDon Jones. Representative Jones, thanks for being here. Thanks, Liz. All right, Representative Jones, let me ask you this. Under Obamacare, it's, it's been fully implemented. It's been fully rolled out. We've had it uh, for seven years, but even giving it the benefit of the doubt and saying the effects didn't go into effect until 2015 fully, there are still 28 and a half million Americans who are uninsured, even uh, who don't have coverage, even with a mandate that says if you don't have coverage approved by Obamacare, you have to pay a penalty. My question is, what about this bill that Democrats are defending here? They're saying it provides coverage for millions of more people. What about this bill is a success if it has a mandate and there's still almost 30 million Americans who don't have coverage? Well, the success comes in when you find out that there are people who even oppose President Obama who now are insured and receive insurance. They are low-income people. They are elderly people who truly needed this Medicaid expansion. Now, of course, in a perfect world, everyone will be covered. But if there's an indication that there's a problem by having 28 million people uncovered, then what kind of problem will we have when we lose the additional 14 and 20 million that are estimated to be lost under this new bill? Right, right. And I'll be interested to hear more details about the Congressional Budget Office. I'm trying to go pretty light on talking about those numbers on the show because their estimates for Obamacare were so far off and have been uh, and have been inaccurate on other bills. So I hesitate to use those numbers as uh, as empirical evidence because they're not their estimates at this point. But I, I guess my question comes down to the the fundamental structure of Obamacare here. The the fundamental structure is to force Americans, you know, or in or to provide them opportunity. It depends on which side of the aisle you're on. To force Americans to purchase this health insurance so that every person is covered, so that people don't have to go to the emergency room. They have health insurance coverage. They're not worried about being bankrupt if they have surgery because they. Have have the coverage again, but when it comes down to it, even with a mandate, even with the government saying you have to purchase this or pay a penalty, 28.5 million people still don't have it. I don't think that that, I, I mean, I don't think that would qualify, even if you fundamentally, philosophically believe that a mandate is the okay thing to do, I don't think that qualifies as a success. I mean, I guess that's one way to look at it, but I'm pretty sure if we look at the numbers of the people who don't pay into any of our taxes, they don't pay for our roads, but they still use them. They don't pay for our education system but they by not paying property taxes, but they still use our schools. There are going to always be a percentage of Americans who don't do what they're supposed to do by participating in something that is truly good for them. That alone is not an indication of how good or how bad the health care bill was. The indication is how many people can we make sure Sure, do not lose their homes, do not lose their lives because of uh, pre existing conditions and because, frankly, right. the insurance <clears throat> companies, corporations that have proven that they are selfish and that they would do whatever they need <clears throat> to do the pockets of the top corporate officers. Right, and I, I think it's more a commentary. You're absolutely right. There are there are freeloaders in any industry in our country. No, de no defense there. I, we agree on that. I think it is a commentary on whether Obamacare is financially sustainable, though, because in order for it to be for it to be able to float with our tax money, everyone has to pay into it, and 30 million people aren't doing that. So they're just uh, we're shouldering that burden. You and I, people that are paying into it, they aren't, and that's what's going to make that's what's making premiums go so far up. But I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this number of people who have have gotten coverage, gotten health insurance coverage since Obamacare, because that's what I've heard Democrats saying this past two weeks that we've been debating Obamacare, debating the Republicans' uh, repeal bill, is what I've heard them say is that 20 million Americans got covered under Obamacare since it was passed. 20 million Americans would lose their coverage. That's what the CBO said yesterday, too, that 14 million next year, up to 24 million over the next decade, would lose their coverage if Obamacare is repealed. Senator Harry Reid even said some of these 20 million people would die if we repeal Obamacare. And this is, again, where I have a hard time accepting this argument, because if that were the case, that may make it a little different. That may make the repeal bill, what I support in the repeal bill, that may make it a little bit different. But when you break it down, since the full rollout of Obamacare in 2015, only 14 million people, not 20 million people, actually gained coverage through Obamacare. And of that 14 million, 
11.8 million of those people, that's 84%, were funneled onto Medicaid. And seven, up to 7 million of those 11.8 million, if you can follow along with the math, would have qualified for Medicaid before Obamacare. So when you actually do the math correctly, when you look at the number of people who gained coverage through Obamacare, through the exchanges because of the law, it's really only about 2.5 million, and that's less than the number of people who lost their care because of Obamacare. It, well, I, that sounds like some really alternative math there, Liz. I'm not sure how those numbers work out, but this is what we John, do know. I mean, they're from Jonathan Gruber, one of the architects of Obamacare in the first place. That may be the case, but here's what we know. There are sick people in our country, one of the richest countries in the world, who needed health care. But for Obamacare, they would not have it. In this new bill, what it now does is shift the money to the corporate offices. So instead of a personal mandate, which had we had support from the Republican Party, had they not spent in Obama's entire term trying to get it repealed, there may have been more people who were actually willing to say, wait a minute, this is a benefit for me. Why am I avoiding it? But we didn't get that. <clears throat> so now what we're going to do is allow insurance companies to add a 30% a 30% hike on the back end if you did not have insurance the year before. What is the point of that? Right, but and I, I guess I don't understand why that why that statistic or the statistic that Democrats have been talking about, about seniors now paying more. Why does that bother you to the point that this repeal bill is a deal breaker, but it didn't bother you that premiums across the country for everybody skyrocketed 25% in some places, 30, 40, 50% in some places. Last year in Arizona, 116%. Why this 30% bother you, but not 116%? Because now these everyday Americans who had coverage that they could afford before Obamacare can't afford and have to pay out of their own pocket. It's very simple, Liz, because the people who are hurt by having to pay this 30 percent are the people who could afford it the least. The truth is, I took a look at how would that affect my family of four here in Georgia with our income and our age. And what I found is under the new health care plan proposal, I would actually see a reduction of $500. Right. Now, I mean, I, I can tell you I can tell you a similar anecdote on the other side. My dad is a small business owner and his health insurance premiums doubled. They doubled. He has children still at home. He provides for my mom. He provides for his employees. His health insurance premiums doubled. Do you know what that means for a small business owner? They can't pay their employees as much. They can't hire people. They have to let people go. So it's it's not it's not all sunshine and roses when you when you talk about these anecdotes about people who hadn't been able to pay. Well, under Obamacare, people who'd previously been able to care for themselves and their families and their employees, now they aren't able to do it. But it sounds like your father was in fact able to do it. And that's the thing. We're putting that I am willing to pay a little bit more because I'm a little healthier, I'm a little younger, I am a small business owner myself, I am willing to pay a little bit more so that our entire country can be healthy. And that is the, it is a fundamental ideological difference that we have in the, between the two parties and the supporters right. and the opponents of these bills. What we think are priorities and, 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 and respect for Right, no, it, I, it, it really comes down to constitutionally. On a personal sense, I agree with you. I personally give to charity because I want to help those less fortunate than me. That's my responsibility. That's my moral responsibility to do so. I don't think anywhere in the Constitution of our country, the governing document that ensures that government doesn't usurp our rights, that they stay within their lane. I don't think there's any constitutional authority for them to say whether or not you're willing, you happen to be willing, a lot of people aren't, whether or not you're willing, you have to do that. We're going to force you to do that. And if we don't, we're going to charge you. We're going to pay. We're going to make you pay a penalty. I mean, it's just unconstitutional. Well, unfortunately, the Supreme Court has stepped in and they've looked at it and they've determined that the way that the bill was drafted was, in fact, constitutional. And therefore, the legislators tried right. unsuccessfully to repeal it. And we can't pick and choose what we think is constitutional. That's what the Supreme Court has decided. And that's the rule of the, that's the law of the land. And everyone is going to want us to respect whatever comes out from the Trump's uh, uh, administration. But we never, ever got the respect and the chance for it. No, I, I, I understand. I understand. And again, that's a fundamental difference in uh, how how these uh, judges on the Supreme Court interpreted it, whether or not it was in fact interpreting the conversation or the Constitution or not. Representative Jones, they're yelling at me in my ear to rap. Uh, we always have such great conversations. Thanks for being here.